Hey, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Can people hear me okay in the back there? Yes. Okay. I am very pleased to be with you here tonight to present to you a report on progress of some recent research. Like many scientific and cultural experiments, this one began quite by accident. It began while I was reading a book about hunting and fishing recently. This book was published in England, in London actually, in 1833. The book is entitled Instructions to Young Sportsmen. It was written by Lieutenant Colonel Peter Hawker. In its book, Mr. Hawker makes an extraordinary claim which I find extremely pertinent to cultural, critical, and even cognitive theory in terms of what it shows us about who and what we are as human beings. Colonel Hawker writes at one point, some dark, warm, windy, drizzly days, early or late in the season, and particularly when a fine breeze blows from off the banks of a river, when no one has begun fishing, the trout are so easily taken that a basket full is but little proof of skill. One might then almost train a monkey to catch a trout. Note that the challenge pose here is not just to catch a fish, but to catch a trout. But what exactly does it mean for a monkey to catch a trout? For example, some animals like bears are able to catch salmon with their jaws. Raccoons can use both their jaws and paws to catch minnows. So what exactly do we mean here to catch a trout? Now thinking about the problem, it's important to put the verb into a kind of context. Professor Hawker is very precise here in talking about the act of angling in the etymological sense, where angling involves the use of a rod with a fixed reel in line. And to the line, one might attach a feathered and furred fly. But the point is more complicated than that because one must also maneuver the fly in such a way to entice a fish or trout to bite at it, to hook it, and also somehow maneuver the fish to shore so that it can be netted. We're talking about the whole concept of catching here. And it is quite a complex operation. In the process of pursuing my research, I've broken it up into three discrete segments. The first stage involves interviews with professional fishermen in Gillies, people who are known as trout bumps in America, addressing the question of what is involved in the process of catching. Stage two interviews involve questions posed to primatologists asking about the cognitive and physiological capabilities of various classes of primates and simians. And the third stage will involve experiential stream side tests with monkeys. I have to apologize for the fact that today we do not have a monkey with us. We tried. The serpentine tried. However, at stage three, we will go fishing with the monkey and we'll report on that. Today, I will present to you the stage one research, which involves mostly the presentation of our hypothesis. Our research begins in Western Maine. Western Maine has a long history and tradition being famous for fly fishing in America. Many famous 
bamboo rod builders and fly pirates all lived in this area of Maine and attract some of America's most knowledgeable fly fishermen. Three weeks ago, we went there to interview three of these fly fishermen. They include Mike Hoza, Muddler, Bob Burke. The name Muddler comes from a very famous fly known as the Muddler Minnow. And our third interviewee is Joel Anderson, who is represented here by a large brook trout that he caught. Joel is one of those guys who fishes alone. It's one of the reasons we don't have pictures of Joel with a fish. It's usually just the fish. I will proceed now with our interviews. They will last about nine minutes. They start with some background information and proceed to the question of the monkey's ability to catch a trout. After the interviews, I will follow up with some hypotheses and hypothetical thoughts about cognitive issues involved here. Okay, can we have our video, please? Welcome to River in Western Maine. It's September, the trees are in color and the fish are hitting. We're happy to have Mike Kota here today. Mike, I'd like to ask you a few questions about your background. Sure. You told me a while ago that you've been coming here for almost 10 years. Can you tell me about your background to fly fishermen? Sure. I think, uh, you know, I've been fly fishing for about 20 years now. and. Uh, start, you know, like many kids in Maine, I started off fishing small farm ponds, riding my bike to and from places. And when my father finally found out that I, was, I had the fishing bug, he started taking me to places in Maine like Stratton and Eustace. And uh, later on in life, as I progressed and, and got to be a better fisherman, I started moving to some of the better uh, rivers in Maine, such as the Kennebago that we're on today. Um, I got into the, the sport probably around the early 80s, I was always fascinated by flies, always fascinated by flies, more so than fly fishing. The idea of catching trout on a fly was not something I thought I was capable of. I'm the type of person who, when I get into something that captures my fancy, I get pretty obsessed with it. I want to learn everything there is to know about it. So I got into, and then it got to the point where I couldn't afford to buy flies and I was making working men's wages. I couldn't afford to buy flies. So I had to, at this point, I had to learn how to tie at least a few rudimentary flies. So, and typical of me, I, I overkill things, as I said, that I get into. So bought the books, bought, you know, and took a couple of classes and just totally dedicated myself to it for a lot of years. We're in the truck with Middler Bob Burke. We're on our way to the Rapid River in the Western Mountains of Maine. Bob, you've been fishing a long time out here. You told me earlier that you've been coming up here for 15 years. Can you tell me a little more about your background fishing up here? Well, I've been fishing up here for about 15 years. When I first started fly fishing, uh, came up to the Rapid River and caught some nice trout and built a lot of confidence up and learned a lot of technical aspects of fly fishing. Tell me a little more about the whole idea of skill that's involved. Well, sometimes just figuring out what the trout is eating, you know, the, the what stage the insect is at again. Um, but sometimes it's, it's, just, it's just foolishness, um, especially this time of year when the I mean, the, the trout and the salmon's a lot like the human male. Um, when it comes to the mating season, they just, uh, they're, they get a little crazy and their common sense leaves them. And it's all, it's all about, you know, how technical you want to make it. My group of the years, I can imagine you caught quite a few trout, or a lot of trout. Can you tell me what's involved here? I mean, it's a lot of skill involved. Sure, uh, some days. Some days there's a lot of skill involved, but other days there, you kind of just fall backwards into a bunch of fish. You know, there's no other way to say it. Some days you can't do anything wrong. 
Other, day, other days, you do everything right skill-wise, but you still can't hook a fish. So usually the truth falls somewhere in the middle. I think some people have an innate ability to cast a fly. And maybe I have that. I don't know. But it's always been very natural to me. I never had to struggle with that part of it. I mean, it was just something that totally captured me. And I wanted to be as good as I possibly could at it. And through the repetition is, is where that skill came from. Mike, have you ever cut a throat without really trying? I and mean, some kind of accident or something like that, like you drop a fly at your feet and the fish jumps up. Have you ever had anything like this happen? Absolutely. Uh, catching fish by mistake, uh, you know, with your rod in your hand. And this happened to me yesterday on the river, where I wasn't using any of my faculties whatsoever, except for the fact that I have an opposable thumb. I could hold on to my rod, and that's really the only thing I was, I guess the only human trait I was really putting into it, because I was holding the rod, I, had, I wasn't watching, I wasn't listening, and, and boom, I had a fish on, and it hooked itself, and that was purely by accident. So yeah, there's, there's uh, multiple ways that you can catch fish by accident. Oh, I've, I've, I've hooked more trout by accident um, than I can, than I could say. It's, it's, it's happened commonly. I'll stop and be talking to a friend and have my fly hanging in the water, not even retrieving it. And, uh, you know, have the, have the trout grab the fly or let, just let the fly hang in the current. Accidents. By accidents, I mean when times when you cut a trout without actually trying. <laughs> you have a situation like that. I mean, Happens all the time. Maybe just tie a fly out, yeah. drop it at your feet, and look at it roots across the river or something. Yeah. The next thing you know, got a trout on your line. Absolutely, if that, that happens. Like that happens. And you, li you like to take credit for it, like, oh yeah, I got one, but you know, that happens a lot. It happened to me, you know, today. Just at the end of a cast, reeling in, because I'm going to move to another spot, all of a fish comes up and just grabs my fly. So, just having a fly in the water, you will eventually hook a fish. And that's what keeps most people coming back. Mike, I'm asking you these questions partly because of a book I was reading lately. It was published in England in 1833. It's called Suggestions for Young Sportsmen. In it, the author poses an interesting dilemma that's perplexed me lately, especially given all due respect for the seriousness, the skill that seems to be involved here. At a certain point, the author said that Sometimes the fishing is really so easy that a monkey could almost be trained to catch a trout. Really, Mike, do you think a monkey could catch a trout? It seems like the, the, everybody always says things are so easy, even a, a monkey can do it or, or a caveman could do it. Uh, but I guess looking at the experience that like I just shared a moment ago about uh, catching a fish yesterday per, you know, by mistake, I was holding onto the rod and that's the only thing I was doing. So I suppose a monkey could hold onto the rod, let the fly swing in the current, and hook a fish. So I guess, yeah, you could teach a monkey how to fish and he probably would catch the one too, but I think day in, day out, I'd outfish the monkey. I think a monkey could catch a trout given the, the right circumstances. Um, I mean, basically, you wouldn't even have to cast. You get some place where there's some trout holding in a river. As long as he could just let it hang in the current, sure, I think he could catch a trout. I don't doubt it. I don't know if a monkey really knows what he's doing, but I'm sure he could be taught to put a fly in the water. And as we already mentioned, just having a fly in the water, the fish will eventually grab it. Something will grab it. So, yeah. Ah, great. Absolutely. Thanks, Carl. All right. No problem. One more question here. Earlier I was talking with the game warden, Reggie Hammond, asking him a few questions about the situation. And Reggie indicated that a monkey would have to have a fishing license. Do you agree that it's fair to a monkey that they have to get a license? Uh, I guess you have to find somebody to buy the license for him first. That's going to be, most monkeys don't live in Maine, so that would probably be a $65 out of, out of state non-resident license. So. Uh, yeah, I guess, uh, you know, if 
and I think the way Reggie put it, if you have to, if the if the monkey was reaching into the water and grabbing a fish with its hands and eating it, well, I, that wouldn't require a license. But if the monkey puts rod in hand and makes a casting motion, I guess, uh, yeah, it would require a license. <laughs> Great, Mike. Thanks very much for your time with us today. I really hope that things go well. And good luck. Thank you. Interviews are very important in the sense that they provide data that we might consult in the construction of a cultural frame for our subject. As many people stated earlier today, context matters. And the fact that a monkey would need a fishing license to fish with the rod in the state of Maine enculturates the monkey further by forcing it conform to the laws or statutes of citizenship. We are not being facetious here. There's a very serious angle to this research, which relates to experiments to teach shapes of human language. Experiments from the early 20th century relied on spoken languages. Later experiments used human sign languages. Of compelling interest is how these various primates were all represented within a human cultural context. In one example, we see the champion team named Chim turning pages of a book, and they're told Chim would seem to take the book and turn the pages carefully and neatly, one by one, as though trying to discover the satisfaction of the operation. In later research, we see Coco, the gorilla, situated in a domestic setting that includes books, reading time, Coca-Cola, and a pet kitten. Coco is also an artist. She makes paintings and shows in galleries. She therefore does not just perform certain linguistic tasks, but is also pro-humanized and enculturated by those tasks. Whether or not the apes are said to succeed in their various prescribed tests, it's not the primary question of our research. Instead, our research aims to investigate the ways enculturation of apes is evidenced by the very research that presupposes scientific disinterestedness. Why should we even care whether a monkey can catch a trout? This is not strictly a question of science or culture, but rather a question of what Chomsky would call Suits me. Thank you. Okay, thank you. This is not really a question of science or culture, but rather a question of what Chomsky would call conceptual analysis. Well, we want to know if the monkey can catch a trout. This question is like the question of wanting to know if a monkey can learn a human language. And we know, based on various accounts, that chimpanzees and gorillas can learn to use a sign language for polymedial communication acts. But what the primates lack is a kind of linguistic mirror of what I call interrogative redundancy. While well, gorilla like Coco can sign cookie me, or cookie me like that, you can't ask the gorilla, what do you mean, cookie me? Because our question contains what linguists call recursiveness, an embedded clause, which is a singularly human capacity. As a research proceeds, we intend to pose a set of relational questions that we hope will tell us more than the outcome of our experiments. That is, whether the monkey can or cannot ultimately catch a fish, it's a small part of our investigation. We would be pleased to see the monkey succeed. 
we would not be displeased to see the monkey go fishless. Like a good scientist, Colonel Hucker qualified to temper his claim by stating the monkey could almost be trained to catch a trout. This pesky little word almost has a long history as a qualifier. Almost there, almost done, almost married. It is a word that it's a saving grace, but what it means exactly in the course of our research awaits the results of our screen side tests. In conclusion now, I would like to present a short one minute video. One minute, please. Okay, one minute video of a chimpanzee named Pian Khan from Japan. This video, which was gleaned from YouTube, shows Pian Khan preparing to go on a fishing trip. Pian Khan shows us the possibilities of where our own research is going, and we look forward to showing you the outcome of this research in the future. Okay. And that is all, thank you. I will take a question or two since I have a few minutes left if anyone would like to ask a question. Oh, come on, someone must have a question out there. Yes. Uh, what would be the equivalent question that you would pose to a human being? It's equally improbable. <laughs> That's a good one. Actually, there's been some research being done with human children and young chimpanzees being taught to open a chart. And the question of whether the human mother and the chimpanzee mother could teach that skill to their young. But what we don't see in the tree church, it's the equivalent back to the humans, for example. Many tests of chimpanzees, particularly where I'm engaged in contact with research, Lincoln Park Zoo in Chicago, where they are doing tests with chimpanzees, teaching their young ones to use a stick, to put it in the hole, to get mustard at the bottom of the hole, not ants. But we don't see the reverse operation where the human mothers are teaching their infants or babies to use the stick to get mustard. Everything is put in the context of a human activity. So we haven't seen what the apes are doing brought back to humans and that's, that would be an interesting way of taking that. So that's a question to go back to humans. You're on a good track there. Thank you with that one. <laughs>